very much, uh, Professor Swaran Singh, and thank you very much uh, to our speaker, Professor Nagao, for joining us today. And thank you to each one for continuing your engagement uh, with the Association of Asia Scholars. As I think uh, several of you have now been introduced to our association through our webinars, which are happening since May 2020. And uh, this is the 38th session of our webinar series. Uh, and our Association of Asia Scholars, we are 300 plus of us uh, from all over Asia, over 10 cohorts. We were selected to study a country of our choice. And therefore, we lived in another Asian country for up to nine months. And uh, that is how uh, the uh, Asian Scholarship Foundation had designed the program. And in 2005, uh, the alumni of South Asia came together and established, uh, formally uh, set up the Association of Asia Scholars. So we are now more than 15 years old. So we are walking and we are understanding what's going on. And we have um, a flagship publication titled uh, Millennial Asia, which uh, began uh, 10 years ago. In fact, it's into its 11th year now. And uh, it's uh, three issues a year. And um, uh, I was uh, just told uh, by our chief editor that in our special issue, which was on COVID-19, published uh, about a month ago, uh, that one particular article, one particular paper has already been downloaded 11,000 times. And some of the other contributions in Millennial Asia's latest uh, issue, a special issue on COVID-19 and its impacts in different ways, has also been downloaded more than 2,000 times. So I think this is uh, really good news for us uh, in the new year. And um, we look forward to all of you also sending us your contributions. It's a SAGE publication. In addition to the journal, which is in its 11th year of publication now, we have uh, published uh, several books and uh, we are now working towards an edited volume of the papers presented in the Revisiting Gandhi Conference, which we organized on uh, 30th and 31st of October last year. So those papers are, the manuscript is almost ready to be sent to the publisher, an international publisher has accepted. And again, uh, today itself, uh, you know, we have received the final approval from the publisher. So we are very happy to share this news as well. And uh, on the 9th and 10th of April, we are organizing another conference titled uh, Multilateralism in the Indo-Pacific. And uh, this is where today's speaker also fits in uh, very well, because Japan uh, itself has been spearheading, as you know, the Quad Initiative. And uh, we are eagerly looking forward to listening to our speaker of today. And uh, to formally welcome our speaker and also to introduce the theme of today's webinar, I would like to request Professor Swaran Singh to please take over. Thank you, Professor Marwa. Uh, it's a delight to have uh, my dear, I can't say old, but young friend, Dr. Satapur, very visible uh, on uh, social media, on uh, I have known him, uh, if my memory serves me right, I think around 2011 or 12. And there was a conference uh, organized by United Service Institution of New Delhi, where Dr. Nagao and I were on the same panel, if he can recall. And then, of course, we met a few times after that. And I think last time we were again in a conference in Sri Lanka in 2018, I think. Uh, I have been aware of his uh, very pointed, uh, sometimes uh, edgy writings. Uh, uh, I'm sure many of you are uh, familiar with him, have known his work. Uh, for the last three years, he was in Washington, D.C., uh, and he's just returned from 
three years of stint as a senior fellow with the the Hudson Institute. Uh, all of you have some idea of Fox News and Hudson Institute uh, playing a very prominent role in uh, policy making and policy explaining in uh, Trump administration times. And in those interesting times, uh, Dr. Rao's and the famous Hudson Institute has just come back from there. Uh, but he wears many hats uh, even now. Uh, let me just mention before uh, I go there, uh, I think his was the first PhD uh, uh, from Japan on India's military strategy in 2011. Uh, I think this was the time he finished his uh, PhD. And uh, since then, he's been writing on issues of India's national security, on India-Japan relations, on India-China relations, and China's overall impact in the region. Uh, another interesting thing, some of you uh, may know, uh, those who follow Japan a little carefully, uh, that uh, Dr. Nagao uh, comes from the uh, University of uh, Tokyo, which is uh, famous for training uh, all the royalty of Japan in that sense. So, uh, most of uh, members of royal family would be uh, graduates from this famous uh, Gakusho in, uh, University in Tokyo. Uh, he's also worked uh, as a security analyst with Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, uh, in Japan, which gives him a kind of a perspective from the inside of policy making. But I would describe him primarily as a think tanker. So he's been uh, uh, attached to several think tanks and associations, organizations uh, in Japan. Uh, and as I just mentioned, uh, he was earlier with the uh, CSIS in Washington, D.C. And uh, more recently, uh, he just returned from Hudson Institute. He's also closely attached to several uh, India-based institutions and journals. Uh, he's been writing regularly on uh, those issues, including, I remember, most recent piece he's just published uh, I saw him uh, you know, on social media with that uh, piece on India-Japan relations. So someone who has focused on policy uh, perspectives uh, from the region uh, connecting Japan, India, Australia, but primarily Japan, India, from how they uh, sort of look at China together. And that makes, I think, uh, the topic and the speaker very exciting. You will see how uh, he analyzes some of these issues uh, completely out of box in that sense. And on a subject which, as Professor Marwa just mentioned, uh, is something we are planning our next international conference. Uh, I was delighted to see that she announced that our uh, book from the last conference on revisiting Gandhi uh, is now finally approved by the publishers. Uh, we are still to sign a contract, so I think I'm not sure to mention the name of publisher there of now. Uh, but our, some of our contributors are with us today. So uh, let me put a uh, caveat that it does not mean end of your chapter writing responsibilities. There might be still referees comments which will come back to our contributors. So there may be still work left in completing that book, but it's formally approved and will be published uh, uh, sometime maybe uh, this year or early next year. Uh, so that's uh, uh, something I, I was delighted to hear uh, Professor Marwa mentioning. She also mentioned about our journal and uh, how uh, one of the article has uh, been downloaded 11,000 times. But we also, for younger uh, participants of today's meeting, I, was, I must mention we are publishing something called uh, AAS Monthly Newsletter. And that has become a platform for several younger scholars to write short commentaries in that. Now, of course, senior scholars are equally welcome in that. Uh, and you would notice perhaps that uh, that monthly newsletter has also run into uh, seven editions already. And now we are getting ready with the eighth edition of that monthly newsletter. So uh, we are trying to engage uh, as many scholars as we can from as many places as we can with interesting topics. And today's topic is extremely interesting because we are discussing today uh, a very, very, uh, very relevant issue to us, which is about escalating competition. Uh, something that we saw last four years of Trump administration uh, showcasing it very, very clearly as, uh, as a rather personalized diplomacy of President Trump. Uh, how escalation in that competition uh, became upfront concern for most regional powers, uh, including India, Japan and Australia. And I requested Professor Nagao to uh, you know, share with us some of his ideas about how this escalating competition of United States and China is being viewed 
from major uh, you know sort of regional powers uh, uh, as far as uh, india indo pacific is concerned so how indo pacific is shaping as a result of that uh, escalating competition how major stakeholders like japan india australia are looking at that uh, escalation and what role they see for themselves in stabilizing that indo pacific region and he kindly agreed to uh, speak to us on that subject uh, very graciously so i'm happy that he's uh, with us today and uh, he would perhaps like to make a powerpoint presentation for about 25 to 30 minutes and then we'll have a chance to each one of you you know asking questions and each question will be answered the one to one basis uh, i also make a kind of a disclaimer that we usually appreciate a very deeply academically grounded uh, question and uh, questions and comments Uh, so as to avoid any rhetorical questions uh, that that is something we avoid in our discussion so all of you are most welcome to engage the speaker in asking questions or making comments but let's keep them academically grounded and, and sort of helping us all to have a take away from today's discussion now with that i will request uh, uh, dr nagao to uh, you know take the floor and uh, unless he wants to make few uh, comments before otherwise he can start by sharing his uh, powerpoint over to dr nagao thank you very much yeah it is an honor to be here with you <laughs> thank you very much um, before i start the presentation i try to introduce my tie because there is india this is map this is map world map but india is center of the world map i want to show. so it is great honor to share idea which uh, the very prominent rich indians in this place it is you so i'm very happy so from this time uh, i will start with the powerpoint so i try to share this one can you see yes we can see your powerpoint now you have to make it in a play mode yes Yeah, I will start the presentation maybe from here to maybe 30 or 40 minutes. We might try to shut up, but uh, yes. Uh, so the title of my presentation is Escalating Competition Between the U.S. and China, Regional Implications. This regional implication means how should India, Australia, and Japan respond to the U.S.-China competition? that is a topic so i joined this as a fellow of the hudson institute fellow and non-resident but for hudson institute this is u.s think tank but uh, today's presentation is perspective from japan so recently china's maritime expansion has escalating in this region And uh, given this aggressive behavior, U.S.-China competition has escalated sharply. So I try to line up what happened the last year and this year during the COVID-19 crisis. Indeed, even before the COVID-19 crisis, China has been provoking many countries. That's true. But we need to remember what happened. While the world faces fallout from the COVID-19 pandemic, China has undertaken a large number of aggressive military operations throughout the Indo-Pacific region. In the East China Sea, Beijing has increased its military paramilitary activities around Senkaku Island, Senkaku Island of Japan and the past Japanese fishing boat inside of the Japan's territorial sea. They are stalkers. In Taiwan, Chinese Coast Guard ship shot in the air. Uh, uh, Chinese Coast Guard ship shot in the air and rammed the Taiwan Coast Guard ship from the rear. This China ship, what happened? I explained. So next one is Taiwan, and I explained. Chinese fighter jet, the bombers enter the Taiwan's air and provoke repeatedly. So in the Hong Kong, China passed a national security law to crack down on the democratic movement. Supported by most of the residents, election proves that. In the South China Sea, 
China's activities are very fluent. They are very busy. In the April 2020, yeah, just completely one year before now, yeah, this month, this, year, this month is March, so not April, but uh, yes, it sank a Vietnam fishing boat, the disputed island, it, they built, it was recent, uh, it has established new districts and two new research facilities to attempt to legitimize its claim. And it has fortified them by deploying new military aircraft. That has happened the spring last year. Chinese survey ship escorted by Chinese Coast Guard ship also entered Vietnamese and Malaysia's EEZ, Exclusive Economic Zone, to further military research. So, and moreover, China dispatched aircraft carrier battle groups around Japan, Taiwan, and South China Sea to hold exercises and intimidate these countries. In yet another incident, China's fleet dispatched to near Hawaii target the U.S. military plane with a laser and rock on in the international airspace. In the Indian Ocean, China sent 12 drones to collect information. And in the autumn, the China dispatched uh, ships to collect uh, data of the Indian missiles. Uh, also, these are happened. China's submarine activity is also very fluent in the Indian Ocean. And in the China border area, you can remember 5,000 Chinese troops entered the Indian side and crashed with Indian forces. 20 brave Indian soldiers were sacrificed their lives. All of this has happened last year. So this year, China's attempt has not changed since then. The Chinese Coast Guard ship entered the territory sea around the Senkaku Island of Japan repeatedly. Uh, after representative of Taiwan was invited in inauguration of the President Joe Biden, many Chinese fighter jets and bombers entered the Taiwan's air. And the deployment of the PLA indicate that China is preparing to invade Pratas Island of Taiwan. China has cracking down the democratic movement in Hong Kong. And view from such kind of situation, even if China agreed to withdraw troops, one part of the Ladakh in India, this withdrawal is just a tactical move. In the long run, it is expected that China will come to the Indian side in the near future. Furthermore, furthermore, the novel COVID-19 virus oriented in China and Beijing conceived the information that ultimately lead to the rapid global spread. So since Australia back the call for the international investigation into the origin of the COVID-19 outbreak, China has imposed the tariff on the Lensing list of the Australian exports. So United States is very frustrated with China. So another this one, this one is a picture I took myself. Such China's activities are directly challenging the US interests and making the US a tough decision. Latest national security strategy of the United States published by the and the Trump administration in December 2017 stated explicitly that China and Russia challenge American power. In October 2018, when the Vice President Mike Pence spoke at the Hudson Institute, so that is a picture I took myself. Indeed, I was the only one Japanese who joined this. Indeed, he said the United States of America has adopted a new approach to China. In 2018, U.S. imposed a tariff on China, setting off the so-called trade war. The Chinese retaliate by imposing their own tariff on the United States, and the trade war escalated. In 2021, new Joe Biden administration does not remove this tariff imposed by the President Donald Trump on China. Another one is quite latest. This is March 1st, 2000, March 1st this year. 
trade policy agenda and the 2020 annual report of the president of the United States of the trade agreement program. That is the name of the report. Clearly mentioned that the Biden administration would also make it a top priority to address the widespread human rights abuses of the Chinese government forced labor program that target the Uyghurs and other ethnic and religious minorities in the Xinjiang Uyghur autonomous, autonomous region and elsewhere in the country. So therefore, US-China relations are becoming increasingly tense. And how should India, Australia, and Japan respond? That is uh, today's topic. There are three steps. Analysis of the China's territorial expansion that is needed. And after that, analysis of US policy toward China, that is second step. And how should India, Australia, and Japan respond? That is third step. So analysis of the China's territory expansion. Why China is provoking us? What should we do? With regard to China's motivation, there is a similarities between East China Sea, South China Sea, and India-China border area. Examining these similarities help to contextualize China's action and indicate neighbors like India, Australia, and Japan should respond to China's provocations. So these are the three important similarities. I will explain one by one. So first one. The first similarity of note is China's repeatedly disregard for the international law when laying claim to new territory. In the East China Sea, China did not claim the Senkak Islands before the 1970s. China's attitude has since changed due to the potential existence of oil reserves in the East China Sea. Now, Chinese Coast Guard ship enter Japan's territorial waters surrounding the Senkak Island and pass the Japanese fishing boat to claim sovereignty over this sea. The non-observance of this international border further demonstrates China's attitude of territorial entitlement and disrespect for the international law. In the South China Sea, the permanent court of arbitration at the Hague rejected China's claim to sovereignty over much of the South China Sea in 2060. Despite this, China continued to claim and occupy the area. And China is expressing the same attitude at the India-China border. In this case, Dr. Rob Sang Sangye, the president of the Tibetan Exile Administration, expressed that Dalai Lama considers the disputed territory of both Ladakh and Arunachal Pradesh to be part of India. Thus, there is a pos high possibility that China's claim to the area along the India-China border is legally baseless. A second recurring facet of China's behavior is its exploitation of military power vacuum. So look at this map. For example, in the South China Sea, China occupied half of the Paracel Island just after France withdrew from Indochina in the 1950s. In 1974, China expanded its presence to the all of the Paracel Island after the US withdrew from South Vietnam. Additionally, China occupied six features of the Spratory Island after the Soviet Union decreased its military presence in Vietnam in 1988. Again in 1995, China laid the claim to Miss Leaf after U.S. troops withdrew from Philippines. In the India-China border area, the military balance has changed recently. 
causing the China to mistakenly infer that there is power vacuum. Looks like South China Sea. According to the CIPRI military expenditure database, CIPRI is a think tank in Stockholm, and they have the database, CIPRI military expenditure database. This is name. Published in April 2020. From 2010 to 2090, this means one decade, 10 years, China increased its military expenditures 85%. In comparison, India increased its expenditure 37%. Note, India's military defense along the India-China border are not weak. But the gap between the two countries, defense budget or military spending, has widened in the last decade. That's also true. And I want to show you another example. Indeed, along with the greater relative increase in military spending, China's military activities has also increased. In 2011, China has made about 230 incursions into the line of actual co control. But since 2011, the number of incursions have increasingly greatly. 426 in 2012, 411, 2013, etc., etc., and uh, 2090, the number reached 663 incursions. So, military balance or well, power vacuum affects the situation. And uh, this year, 2000, uh, yeah, sorry, did not this year, but uh, now the 2021, but 2020, when India and the world are Focusing on the COVID-19 crisis, China is trying to exploit the situation even more aggressively. Indeed, uh, what happened in the India-China border area is what happened in the East China Sea too, including sea around Senkaku Island of Japan. This is the data. This is the number of the Chinese vessels identified within the contiguous zone in the water surrounding the Senkaku Island in Japan. When we compare the two figures, we will find one similarities. This one is similarities. Since 2011, the activity has increased in both areas, and in 2090, the activity has increased again. So India and Japan face the same problem. And so what happened in the India-China border is what happened in the East China Sea. Maybe what happened in the South China Sea too. This is a situation, just hard similarity. Finally, China's arguably lawless expansionism is usually paired with an effort to exclude countries that are outside the region. In the East China Sea, and South China Sea, China blames its assertive behavior on the intervention of outsiders. Similarly, in the case of the India-China border, China is trying to halt India's cooperation with the US, Japan, and Australia. Recently, India just concluded a logistical support agreement with Australia. Recently means last year and this year both indeed indeed but uh, this has happened in the June last year and in September last year India and Japan concluded a similar pact. Japan called this AXA, but uh, similar with the LSA logistical support agreement. So all four countries, so India, US, Australia, and Japan we have agreed a logistical support agreement. China believes that these agreements among these four countries are the effort at the containment, so and therefore want to stop them. To do so, which country would China choose to pressure? The most likely answer is India, because China and India share a nearly 4,000 kilometer land border Unlike the US, Japan, and Australia, we share the sea border but not land border. So, allowing China to ravage its army. And moreover, China perceived that 
it can more easily persuade India to leave the U.S. lead security framework because India and the U.S. are not formal ally. Much like its behavior in South China Sea, China is using its military to pressure India to drop foreign partnership that might inhibit China. So analysis of the China's behavior is end. And second one, analysis of the U.S. top policy toward China. There's a high possibility that recent U.S. actions are part of long-term strategy. First reason is U.S. has prepared for all scenario, even unlikely one, in the competition. The United States is now world's only superpower, a status it acquired by defeating rivals, Germany, Japan, and the Soviet Union. We can learn a lesson from history. Japan has unfortunate and tragic history of war with the United States. Yet perceived, and uh, yet precisely for that reason, it can confidently tell the world not to underestimate US policy toward China. During the 1920s, the US developed a set of hypothetical war scenarios for engaging other countries, a common practice in the scenario planning. Before World War II, the U.S. plan for the confrontation with Japan was known as Orange Plan. Though it was not precisely executed, it did indicate a general strategic direction. Similarly, the U.S. had a war plan prior to the confrontation with Germany in World War II. This is Black Plan. But uh, when these plans were declassified in 1974, people were surprised that before World War II, the U.S. also had a war plan to confront the British and Canada, the Red Plan. This fact indicates that the U.S. prepare for all scenarios, even unlikely ones. Therefore, Japanese take seriously the U.S. frustration with China and believe that Washington has a plan for confronting Beijing. And secondly, Republicans and Democrats have a similar view of China. An example is the U.S.-China high-tech war, technology war, and Washington's ban on products made by Huawei and ZTE. This process started during the Obama administration, not Trump administration, which in 2012 published an investigation report on the U.S. national security issue posed by the Chinese telecommunication telecommunication companies, Huawei and ZTE. After its publication, U.S. government began to ban the federal agency from purchasing from the two Chinese telecom companies. So since the Republicans and Democrats have a similar view of China, recent events are merely part of long-term strategy. And thirdly, now is the best chance for the U.S. will get because the country might only be able to win if it step up now. Some simple facts in 2018 confirm that now is the best time for the U.S. to pressure China. Why 2018? This is the year of the latest national security strategy as published and Vice President Mike Pence's speech in Hudson Institute as made. I mentioned above this one, but that, is, that was the timing. For example, this is one of the example. U.S. spent more on defense in 2080, maybe four times bigger compared with China. And the GDP, if we check the GDP, the U.S. still reading GDP that time, 2080. And U.S. and U.S. spend more on the research and development 
And compare with, with the GDP, gap is more narrow. In case of GDP, 10 versus 6. US and China, 10 versus 6. But research and development, 10 versus 8. So based on current military balance, economic strength, and technology, now is the best chance for the US will get because the country might only be able to win if it step up now. That is the situation, that is the analysis of the US policy towards China. So we enter the third one. How should India, Australia, and Japan respond? How should India, Australia, and Japan respond to China? China's lack of respect for the international law, expansion of the territory claim, where there are power vacuum, and effort to exclude outside actors from regional intervention are all common theme of China's exploit in the East China Sea, South China Sea, and now India-China border. Thus, the question remains, how do countries affected by China's ambitions, like India, Australia, and Japan, respond? Knowing the pattern of China's behavior point towards the answer, they, what we, should do the opposite of what China wants. Firstly, countries around China must continue to respect the rule-based order grounded in the current international law. Second, China's neighbors need to fill the military power vacuum by increasing their defense budget. But, is there a problem? Okay. Third, countries around China need to continue to enhance security cooperation with the US and other like-minded countries. So when India, Australia, Japan, etc. cooperate with the US or other like-minded countries, the partnership should promote not only regional security, but also economic cooperation. The strength of China's army depended on the ample military budget. The China's neighbors should avoid supporting China's economy by strengthening relations with the US and other like-minded countries. If those in the Indo-Pacific region care to limit China's territorial encroachment, they we must directly counter China's behavior and intentions. That is, uh, how should India, Australia, and Japan respond to China? How should India, Australia, and Japan cooperate with the U.S.? Currently, the U.S. is requesting cooperation from India, Australia, and Japan, both military and economy. And uh, one more is value. Military, the U.S. wants these partners, countries, to share the security burden by increasing our defense budget and participating in the military activities and in importing the American weapons. And in this case, long-range strike capability could be key. Economically, the U.S. is requesting that India, Australia, and Japan adopt the same tough policy against China. So what can I do? There are two things we should do. First, we should improve our own defense capabilities. Indeed, uh, recently, India, Australia, and Japan are all planning to possess 1,000 kilometer to 2,000 kilometer long range strike capabilities such as the cruise missile, the grind bomber uh, with the fighter jets at the same time, indeed. The offensive defense combination with the long range strike capability is a more effective strategy than the defense only strategy when these countries face China's territory expansion. Countries around China need to reduce China's 
overconfidence in its military capability to deter its territory expansion. One of the most e effective methods is making China defend multiple fronts. For example, if both India and Japan possess long-range strike capabilities, this combined capability makes China defend multiple fronts. Even if China decides to expand its territory along the Indiana border, China still needs to expand a certain amount of its budget and military forces to defend itself against Japan. In addition, to deal with the route China is using to expand its territories, long-range strike capability is useful. If the stretch or other choke point are under the range of the US, Japan, India, Australia strike capability, China cannot have the confidence in using these routes. In the case of mountains, India-China border area, India can attack the strategic bridges, bridge tunnels, or airports anytime by using missiles. This reduced China's confidence in the using this strategic infrastructure. That is the reason India tests many missiles. This is a list I made and published. The long-range strike capability India has shown since September 2020. India tests many missiles, you know, and this is a list of missiles. Another one is, this is a long-range strike capability Australia is planning to possess. And this is a list of the long-range strike capability Japan is planning to possess. All of these three, we can find the same range, 1,000 to 2,000 kilometers. And secondly, we should not depend on China economically. India and Japan must reduce our economic dependence on Beijing if we wish to avoid becoming passenger on the sinking ship. Both India and Japan have already started to reduce its dependence on China, and Japan calls Australia to do the same. In the case of Japan, for example, so April 2020, so completely last year, Japan earmarked 2.2 billion of its recorded economic stimulus package to help local manufacturers shift production out of China to the India and Southeast Asia. And indeed, many Japanese companies have relocated their factories in China to Southeast Asia and South Asia. As a result, number of Japanese citizens living in China is decreasing and has gone from 150,000 in 2012 to the 116,000 in 2019. That is the figure. Number of Japanese live in the United States, on the other hand, has increased from the 410 in 2012, yes, 2012, to the 444,000 in 2019. In addition, the US, especially the new Biden administration, think the value is also important. India and Australia and Japan must continue to respect the rule-based order grounded in current international law. That is what I said. But not only this, human rights issue, democracy issue, these issues are also important. That is what I want to say. So China's aggressive territorial expansion spurs the US to take a tough stance toward it. And U.S. allies of friendly countries like India, Australia, and Japan need to re-evaluate their role, our role. 
the security situation will demand that these three countries make a drastic change. This will also give us an opportunity to cooperate more deeply with the US and form a new partnership. So now is the time for the Quad to do so. That is my presentation. And thank you very much for listening. I should end the sharing. Thank you, Dr. Nagao, uh, for this extremely well-structured uh, presentation that you made uh, just now with enormous detail and uh, very attractive uh, visuals. Uh, I was particularly impressed by some of the visuals, uh, like the one you showed, how China uh, has been making gradual advances into South China Sea and looking at each time frame and in showing that in multiple colors. Uh, but equally interesting was uh, your showing of a very interesting uh, coincidence of uh, China's increasing activities, as you mentioned, or incursions, as we call it, uh, both in case of uh, Senkaku Island and, of course, on the China-India border. So there is a certain uh, uh, sort of coincidence here of, uh, of certain trends that we can notice uh, that definitely uh, should bring China, uh, bring Japan and India closer uh, in uh, uh, at least sharing a mutual understanding of issues. Uh, it's a delight to uh, see that very interesting PowerPoint that you just uh, shared with us uh, while you were making comments. Uh, also very interesting visual on how the total number of Japanese living in China have really been gradually decreasing compared to number of Japanese. And you, of course, added one number into that, increasing living in the United States. I think very interesting and a very nice academic presentation. We appreciate that. And let me say that I already see three participants having raised hand. Uh, two are already on my screen. Before that, uh, Dr. Gur Sangeet Barar had also raised uh, the hand, but I don't see that name now in my list. But we have three uh, names already uh, requesting for the floor. Uh, as usual, I will uh, request uh, participants to make uh, my life easier and make a uh, speaker uh, understand and look at you when he uh, responds to your comment or answers your question. Uh, so I can see that we have a certain number of people who are willing to ask questions. Please uh, identify yourself so that speaker can understand as to from where that question is coming uh, or comment is coming and then uh, make your comment or uh, ask your question. I will begin with Dr. Avishek Srivastava to uh, unmute and ask the first uh, question or make the first intervention. Uh, Abhishek, yes. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, sir. Uh, uh, Dr. Nagao, uh, very incisive and insightful uh, presentation. I am Dr. Abhishek Srivastava from School of International Studies, JNU. I am assistant professor here. I would love to listen your views on the extension of Quad. As Secretary Blinken has recently uh, talked with uh, uh, his counterpart of Bangladesh and he quoted a greater Indo-Pacific region. So as you are uh, uh, in context of South Asian uh, region, uh, only India is the part of Quad. So do you think that uh, Bangladesh and other South Asian countries can also join Quad? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, this is a good question. So, because uh, on surface, Quad is just symbolic move. But indeed, when I we see it, the development of the long-range long strike capability, indeed, the Quad is moving. So, including the Quad Plus, many countries, is also moving. Compare with the EU, the Indo-Pacific region is too big. For example, the size. When you check, when we check the size of the EU, 
this is similar size with Indonesia. Indonesia if Indonesia includes a sea part between the islands, the size is same with the EU. So forming EU is very big job, tough job, but they have achieved. But forming Indo-Pacific cooperation, how much effort we need to use, we need to spend? Maybe this is huge. So one by one, the Indo-Pacific cooperation should expand. And in this case, to including Bangladesh, other South Asian countries, or other US rising Europe, these are the very important. And the multilateral basis, we should cooperate, establish the big market instead of the market in China, or the, we create a new security system, network-based security system, not a hub and spoke. A hub and spoke means that the bilateral relation between US and other country, uh, this kind of the bilateral based cooperation makes uh, one kind of hub and spoke system. U.S. is center and the other allies is around. And uh, only U.S. connect with uh, each country. But these U.S. allies, for example, Japan and Australia is not ally. Japan ally with the U.S., Australia ally with the U.S., and the US, U.S. control all of it. And uh, this system depends on the U.S. power only. This is a hub and spoke system. But now, Situation has changed. US request also changed. Let's create a network. 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 Japan and Australia should cooperate each other. Japan and Bangladesh cooperate each other. This is new type of network system instead of hub and spoke. Including Bangladesh, including Sri Lanka. Of course, India should lead this. This is new type of more equal, more democratic security system in this region. So, including Bangladesh is welcome, in, and India should read it. That is my opinion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you, Dr. Nagao. Dr. Nagao, perhaps you can see on screen your friend. Dr. Pastirao is also with us, and she's also willing to make a comment or ask a question. But for benefit, for uh, some of benefit of some of our audience, I'll request uh, Dr. Rao also to introduce yourself and uh, make your intervention. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, you know, Dr. Singh. Um, well, it's great, uh, Satoru San. Hi, how are you? I hope you're doing good. I really enjoyed your presentation a lot, and uh, just for the, uh, you know, just. To sort of share it with the audience here, I think uh, mine and Satoru San's friendship goes back now almost 11 years. So, yeah. you know, I've kind of seen him. Yes, you know, his academic, brilliant academic career take off and his hard work is very exemplary. So it is really an honor, you know, to have you here. And I really welcome you and applaud you for a very good presentation. Um, yeah, yes, you're welcome. Um, I am Swasti and I teach um, uh, strategic and security studies at Alikar Muslim University. And I have a little question for Satudu San, which is that if you may be noticing the news that is coming today. So, you know, uh, we saw that the you know, government of India is planning to clear 45 investment proposals worth millions of dollars that were put on hold. You know, including those like auto, uh, uh, including those from auto companies like Great Wall Motors and SAIC Motor Corp, all Chinese uh, companies, mm -hmm. which were put on hold during the tensions on the LAC. So uh, now, obviously, this is a pragmatic move by the Indians because you know our economy is in doldrums, and we all understand the value of you know pragmatic uh, uh, cooperation, etc. But um, what sense does it make? Uh, in the context of, you know, on the one hand, when the Quad is trying to counter China. So very briefly, I would like to know your opinion on this policy of the Indian government. How do you view it? Because obviously you are a huge enthusiast for, uh, you know, the coming together of the Quad country. So how an expert like you, I mean, how would you view it? That is my question. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Teacher asked the proper question, and this is the best question, I think. And uh, yes, in my opinion, as a card, 
this is useful. China withdraw troops and India accept investment. But at the same time, we have already seen the number of incursions China has done last decade increasing. So this move will be just tactical move. Next time China enters the Indian side, India will stop it as a card. So this is not a long-term economical trade between two countries, I think. It right. will end soon, but if China continue the same course, indeed it will happen, I believe. China enter again and stop the investment. <laughs> so not worry so much. This is just card of negotiation, I believe. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for asking. <laughs> Many people want to ask this question. You're I think. Always welcome. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Magao. Uh, let me move to the next uh, person here, Dr. Kush Kumar Gaisen. Please unmute yourself and you can introduce yourself to the speaker. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Nagao. Uh, I'm Kush Kumar Gayasain. I teach political science and international relations in Mongolia University in Bihar. I did my PhD from JNU Seaport under Professor Swaran Singh. Sir. Uh, so thank you so much for uh, making such a complex topic look so simple. So that's what I could see in your presentation. Uh, so my uh, questions, in fact, it's like I was wondering that uh, in your presentation, you have shown that uh, uh, the Chinese, the neighbors of China, the and the countries around China, they should be basically building up their military capabilities. They, they basically, they should be enriching their uh, military inventories. So apart from that, India, Australia, Japan, they should also be sort of uh, enhancing their relationship with the United States, both military, economic, or even in terms of values. So don't you think that this will only corner China? And instead of making it, you know, uh, sort of bringing up out some solution, it can only com complicate things, what we are already seeing in Indo-Pacific Quad and etc. So I, I, I want your opinion on that. And the last th the question is, uh, we are, I mean, India is already, you know, thinking seriously about uh, RCEP, regional cooperation on this uh, economic partnership. So how Jap and Japan and China, they're already with this RCEP. India is not part of RCEP. How do you think Japan and India, they can somehow, I mean, come to some you know positive uh, conclusion where uh, it can really help both these countries uh, with regard to RCEP. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you very much. The, the two questions are uh, very good questions. Uh, I have many very good questions today. Uh, first one, yes, there is a possibility to complicate. So that's true. Because possessing the strike capability means that this country can be independent. For a long time, Australia and Japan depend on the strike capability of the United States. US can control the situation, but Australia and Japan cannot control the situation. Even if Australia has a will to attack or Japan has a will to attack independently, they cannot attack because they lack the strike capabilities. But now the US requests to share the burden Instead of the United States, U.S. allies or friendly countries should possess their independent strike capability. This means that these all countries which possess the strike capability can decide strike or not themselves. This means that uh, United States can, there is a possibility United States cannot control detail of the whole situation. For example, the Israel. United States, for a long time, United States hesitated to give the strike capability to the U.S. allies, but the exception is Israel. Israel received many weapons from the United States, but the United, Israel is, Israel is located very near from their enemy, Arab countries. So, even if the, these weapons are not long range, Israel can use this weapon as a strike capability. So Israel promised the United States if the Israel receives F-16 fighter jets, they will not strike as a country. But just, uh, just after they receive the F-60, they bombs the nuclear plant in Iraq. 
that is uh, constructed by France in Iraq to prevent Iraq possess the nuclear power in 1981. That was what happened. After that, US need to admit this strike, even if this is not included in the agreement between US and Israel. So if Allies has own independent strike capability, more after join international relations. That's true. But at the same time, China's rapid military modernization demand to US allies and friendly countries to do more. And uh, even if they're limited, this country needs strike capability. That is also true. Without strike capability, there is no pressure toward China. So it is unavoidable, I believe. So this, I have already explained, compared with the hub and spoke system, this new network-based security corporation, still US lead security corporation, but uh, this network's uh, US lead security corporation is establishing now. But uh, indeed, uh, compared with the hub and spoke system, this network-based security corporation is more equal, more democratic. Because all of the actors joined this network has the right to decide something because of, because of offensive capability, because of strike capability, or because of the network. Japan and Australia can cooperate without negotiation with the United States. Of course, these two countries have the will to cooperate, will uh, communicate with the United States very deeply. But uh, indeed, Japan and Australia only, they can negotiate, uh, they can negotiate without US involvement indeed. They can cooperate directly. In this case, we need to counter actor more in the, this network-based security system, even if US is strongest. So this Indo-Pacific cooperation, this Quad cooperation is not a US dominated cooperation indeed, but uh, of course, uh, Japan has a will to respect the U.S. as a leading country of the, this system. And uh, of course, that is the reason it is relatively easy for India to join this system, I believe, because India has a pride as an independent actor. India can decide their fate themselves. This network-based system is more equal, more, more democratic. So will situation complicate? There is a possibility, such kind of possibility, it exists. But big benefit and few risk, I believe. So that that is the reason I support this system. Thank you, Thank you very Na much. Thank you, Dr. Nagao. But uh, I think there is a mainstream uh, imagination in India that it is the United States actually which is leading this free and open Indo-Pacific and quadrilateral security dialogue. Uh, of course, it works through its alliance partners, uh, particularly Japan and uh, Australia. And there is also a sense here that uh, compared to uh, Prime Minister Shinzo Abe, uh, Prime Minister Suga perhaps is relatively cautious uh, when it comes to China's sensitivities vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the quadrilateral security dialogue. Uh, you may respond to that if you wish at some stage, but let me invite now Ms. Barkha Dube. Uh, please unmute yourself, introduce yourself, and then you can make your intervention. Thank you. Uh, okay, so about your comment, uh, I need to say, yeah, India's perception, I agree with you, sir. Uh, but at the same time, so compare with the past, compare with the perception, of Japan, Japanese. In the past, we depend on the US more. Now the US demand Japan to do uh, more as an independent actor, independent friend with the United States. So compare the past, more independent, more democratic, more equal. That's true. So 
because uh, lack of the experience in the past in their field. This is a US lead, US controlled. Uh, but uh, view from the other ally of the United States, traditional ally of the United States, indeed, more open and more equal, we believe. Uh, well, that is a gap I try to explain. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Malkandove, please go ahead. <laughs> So thank you for such an enriching talk. Uh, I think my answer, the question, like my answer is, I have already received my answer from uh, most of the responses, but still I would like to go on. And so my question is that, uh, as we all know that uh, Chinese advancing hegemony in the South Asian region is not a new story, obviously, and it's been happening and it's continuing more. And like-minded countries like India, Australia, uh, uh, US, they're all coming together and, you know, they're all uh, uh, actually framing anti-Chinese policy in their countries. Okay, but I feel that alternatively what can happen is these countries can also take China as an opportunity to actually know what China wants and actually uh, negotiate with China in terms of many other aspects. But this is somewhere, but this is something which is, I feel somewhere this is lagging. So, and as Varun sir had introduced that you have also worked as a fo foreign policy analyst. So in your opinion, I would like to know that how do you think can a country's foreign policy work better in this direction? I mean, what is your opinion and what is your take on this direction? Could you please repeat the question itself again? Because uh, maybe uh, uh, because of the communication, uh, it looks like jumping, jumping, jumping. <laughs> So could you please, yeah, this is not your fault. This is uh, maybe mechanical problem. Actually, my internet is behaving very badly today. It, it usually doesn't happen, but I don't know. I Shall I just go on repeating it again? Yeah, just okay, could you please, uh, yeah, the uh, question itself, please. Okay, okay. So, so uh, as you know that uh, many countries like India, Japan, and uh, Australia, and um, I mean the Quad countries, basically these like-minded countries, they're coming together to actually uh, kind of counter China and they're framing anti-Chinese policy. But um, alternatively, they can also take China as an opportunity. They can actually negotiate with China in many other aspects so that they actually know what China wants actually. Because many of us even do not know that what actually China wants. So uh, as you have also worked as a foreign policy analyst, I would like to know you hearing more on this. Okay. Uh... Okay, the, uh, yeah, this is a good question. And uh, I remember that I have already skipped one question, the uh, last question I asked me. And uh, so I combined the, uh, answer, I combined the two questions and the, I try to answer as an integrated answer. Uh, yes, how to deal with China that there is a gap of the perception between the half of Japan or another half of Japanese. Uh, the, in, my, in my presentation, I have already mentioned more of the analysis, US strategy toward rivals. Indeed, in the history, there is no survivors to compete with the United States. Germany, Japan, and Soviet Union, all of them are gone. And that country is a country. They claim that their history is only 244 years. But if that is true, United States only need 169 years to change from the just a colony of the British Empire to the only superpower in the world. And they keep the status in the last 75 years. So this means that this U.S. system is a very powerful system. If this United States start to claim China is a competitor, this is a counter to the competition. There is a high possibility that current China will be disappeared. So what China wants, that is very important. But uh, I'm concerned. If the country around China improved uh, China too much, this country will be the passenger of the sinking ship. That is uh, my perception about the US strategy toward China indeed. 
But at the same time, the last question I asked, the opinion about RCEP. Indeed, the concept of the RCEP is completely different. The including the many countries, many countries around China joined this RCEP. And, and uh, by, show, by sh showing the influence of the many countries around China, they try to limit China's influence and manage China's influence and develop uh, with China economically in this region. Because China is rising and uh, in increasing their influence in the Indo-Pacific region, so we need the system to manage it. And uh, this system try to seek the soft landing. What, uh, what kind of analysis I have done to the US policy toward China, US will destroy China, it looks like. So this means this is hard landing. But RCEP is different. RCEP seeks a soft landing. So which one is better, maybe future, Maybe only God not, I, I, I should say. But uh, at the same time, in my analysis, the effort related to RCEP is wasting effort, I believe. Because I believe the fate of China is not so bright. Once you start to say China is competitor, they will come. then the China will be destroyed. And, uh, not now, maybe 10 years later, 45 years later, I don't know, because the Cold War has really long, and Cold War is not military confrontation, US-Soviet Cold War in this case, but finally, we cannot see the, that country. We can see the 15 separated countries, the former Soviet Union, but we cannot see the Soviet Union itself. Japan great empire, it's disappeared. Only Japan will find. So view from this history, China's fate is not bright, I believe. That is my answer. So soft landing, hard landing, which one is better? So maybe I believe hard landing will come in the future and how soft on the damage is the policy we need, I believe. That's the answer. Thank you, Dr. Nagao. Let me now request Dr. Chandra Bhushan Nagar, who's been waiting patiently. Uh, I'm sure I can see some other names. Vikhyat uh, Date is also with us. Then we have Muzaffar Hussain and Rakesh Arya had also raised hand at some stage. But we'll begin now with Dr. Chandra Bhushan Nagar. Please unmute yourself and make your introduction. Yeah. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, Dr. Nagao, it's really a good presentation what you have made. Actually, myself, Dr. Chandrabhushan Nagar, I teach political science at National Defense University, which is a military institution, comes under the aegis of Ministry of Defense, Government of India. Actually, primarily, we deal with the military affairs on, the, on a very primary basis because we come across certain opinions also after the recent standoff between India and China with some people, those who were on the ground to witness the disengagement process. Actually, I have a little comment to made. My comment, uh, I have two comment, brief comments to made. Uh, I want to know your opinion on that. First comment is that uh, recently there were certain opinions, uh, those who explained that uh, the recent disengagement process between China and India, and before that, a certain series of clashes were held on the borders in Leh Ladakh. This has been for the first time that uh, Chinese PLA people were shocked to see the aggression of the Indian armed forces on the ground, which was earlier not on the scene. This has been a change in dynamics of the Indian aggression on the border to manage its own, uh, uh, what is the conflict on a real time basis. So do you think that uh, India should uh, could come forward to join Quad? And uh, it, it, it creates a lack of impression that India may not able to handle its own particular regional interest either in maritime domain or on the land boundaries. Because there is certain changing perceptions which always emerge. Because you can look, have, you can have a look at one of the recent article written by Cloudy Apri in the Indian Express. The reasons why China was, you know, made, made compulsory to disengage. Their own perception, number one, what she has narrated, and number two, which I have quoted about the uh, changing impression of the Indian armed forces so far, their stand up on the border is concerned. 
second thing i would like to ask you is that uh, do you think that uh, this uh, quad formation should be converted into a nato like military formation which could have an aggressive stand because japan also is a me member of the nato so how do you think thank you so much sir uh thank you very much two questions both of two question are very uh, important question um Uh, in my opinion, India should join the Quad, of course, and strengthen relation with the Quad. But uh, and uh, I believe India deal with China very well this time, and India won. I believe, but still, India need India should not underestimate China. I believe because uh, after the crash of the Garwan Barrel last year, uh, China concentrate China relocate. Missile forces, uh, bombers from eastern side to southern side, in front of India, and uh, so under such kind of situation, India can imagine many type of limited war or limited uh, military operation. If the traditional uh, hand to hand fight, India can won. Of course, India have already won. But uh, limited use of the latest missile is also an option for China to do. And in this case, India needs same type of missile to retaliate uh, because uh, retaliate capability uh, is the capability to, to deter such kind of attack. So, but uh, when we check uh, many type of the high-tech war looks like this type of missiles, India's inventory is not enough to deal with China, at least currently. In the future, India possess more lineup, but uh, not just now, because uh, when we check the uh, military budget, military expenditure, China has advantage, huge advantage. This is uh, just simple money, size of money. So many type of option China has, and uh, some of the option. Current Indian inventory cannot deal with it. But uh, if India cooperate with Quad countries, you know, US, Japan, Australia, India can get more option to deal with China. And we can divide China's defense budget more multi at the same time. If we create a cooperation, we can seek more peaceful solution, peaceful security deterrence. So it is beneficial for both of us, both of the US, Japan, Australia, and India. So Quad is beneficial. So that is the reason India should join Quad. This is my analysis. And uh, but can Quad to be the NATO-like security cooperation? In my personal opinion, I wish. <laughs> To make the Quad to be the Asian NATO, that's true, and Pompeo wished uh, that government wish that's also true. But uh, I have already explained the size of the Indo-Pacific. EU equal Indonesia means that more difficult job to form. That is the reason the network based or more rough based cooperation, more equal based cooperation, or more democratic based cooperation is only way. US cannot control all of it, I think. But at the same time, if we create a democratic based security system in this region, each country has, because of each country has the will, we can cooperate in this case. Indeed, if the people If the country has their own will to join this kind of security cooperation, indeed, this is more stronger than the, just a US lead cooperation, I believe. So, indeed, this is uh, maybe proper way, I believe. So, I cannot say the Quad will be the Asian NATO, but uh, One kind of the security cooperation based on the will of each country can be made, I believe. That is my answer. Thank, Thank you very much for asking. Maybe I, I, I wish uh, this is a proper answer for your question. <laughs> so. 
I was waiting, Doctor Nagao, to see you bringing in Asian NATO. Luckily, you got the chance to speak about it. Uh, of course, I understand that uh, both in Japan and India, the mainstream opinions and, uh, of course, official versions are uh, always shy of calling it Asian NATO. Yeah. So uh, happy to see that you are able to speak, uh, you know, as a think tanker. Floating ideas that potentially might become extremely relevant. Uh, let me request now Muzaffar Hossain, who is a formerly student from my center, now teaching in Hyderabad, to please unmute yourself, introduce yourself, ah. and uh, thank. Thank you, thank you, Professor Sohan Singh. Uh, this is Muz University Hyderabad. Uh, that was uh, quite an interesting lecture, Doctor Nagaro. Definitely thought-provoking prescriptions. Uh, but uh, one of the weakness which I felt uh, uh, in your presentation or this conceptualization of Asian order was the vantage point. You spoke from definitely Japan, vantage point of Japan, but from the vantage point of India, one of the issue would be, I say, if you talk about a grand strategy kind of position, uh, uh, just confinement to or looking, conceptualizing it as an issue of Indo-Pacific doesn't entirely capture India's insecurities or concerns. So in that context, India to approach in that direction automatically requires bringing in Russia or the entire wider development in the entire Asian region, uh, Iran or Russia for that matter. And uh, in that context, we can see that the recent conversation between India and Russia on a possible cooperation towards ASEAN. Second, uh, this whole story of Indo-Pacific how is it going to unfold with respect to ASEAN? Because ASEAN, again, is central to Indo-Pacific. And uh, what impression we get that most of uh, conceptualizing a small power in world politics, most of these countries love to have India as counterweight to China, but not as a replacement to China. And trade, again, remains central. And finally, this whole idea of network-based security system, I feel like even if... Uh, definitely informal alliance or Asian alliance, but in absence of a strong threat perception, eventually it looks like that uh, uh, it is going to face a problem of uh, abandonment and, and, and buck passing. Thank you. I think there was some disturbance. I think. We could hear you clearly. In that, uh, oh, okay, you thank know. you. Uh, in my perception, there are two questions. The first one in the Russia and Middle East, the role of Russia, and the Middle East. Another one is the uh, uh, role of ASEAN. Is this the right perception? Yes. And the last one, third one, last on one. this entire idea of network-based security system, you can call it informal alliance. So classically, alliance, any alliance formation would face problem of abandonment or uh, the problem of buck passing, where one alliance partner is entirely relying other to take uh, the responsibility while in context of uh, a ASEAN order or towards China still I don't think that the th threat perception is so strong and eventually I feel that even this idea of network based security system is going to face those problems okay so maybe I wish uh, my answer will be proper for these three questions no, so one by one I will try to Okay, Russia's role is very limited, I believe, because uh, Russia has motivation to support China in this case. Why uh, supporting China is beneficial for Russia? I try to explain. Because uh, if, uh, if there is no China threat, or if the United States do not think China is a main threat, which country will be the main threat for the United States, U.S. will realize? Traditionally, Russia is the target. After the Russia's annexation of the Crimea, or the intervention in the Eastern Ukraine, Syria, Libya, Russia is under sanction of the United States and the European country. Under such kind of situation, what kind of uh, situation Russia tried to create, or Russia afraid? Russia afraid the isolation in the international stage. Their income came from the exporting resources, natural resources. 
So, if the, all of the country、uh, decide not to import natural resources from Russia, Russia faces a crisis. So, for Russia, China is a very important buyer. And at the same time, to avoid the isolation, Russia, has a, Russia needs to maintain the relation with China. And if the, Russia support China and China growing up and the US perceive China is main threat instead of Russia, there is a possibility that US want to cooperate with Russia against China. So in this case, supporting China is very beneficial for Russia. So view from Japan, we cannot trust Russia so much because of the, because we share the border, that's true, but at the same time, But at the same time, so,、uh, Russia has a motivation to support China. That is another reason. And, but、uh, to prevent, prevent Russia c o o p e r a t e with China, Japan tried to negotiate with Russia that time and failed indeed. <laughs> but I believe failed. But、uh, Japan tried to do that. So indeed,、uh, we cannot trust Russia, we believe. But at least in my perception. But Middle East is more complicated. During the Trump administration, the situation is more simple. The, or the, well, start from the Obama administration, but the Trump administration、uh, enhanced the speech of this move. They withdraw, US withdraw from Middle East and Europe and relocate their forces in the Indo Pacific, or the saving the resources. To create a new armed forces or establish a new,、uh, armed, a new military power to deal with China. Because the、uh, current pace of the China's、uh, military expenditure, which is increasing very rapidly, US n e e d to do something drastically because the US cannot increase the defense budget so much. So they try to withdraw from the Europe and Middle East. In this case, someone needs to, need to take charge in this region. Europe, NATO should increase their defense budget. Why US demand it? Because US need to withdraw. And in the Middle East, US asked Saudi Arabia to take charge. And the US try to negotiate with many Arab, Arab countries to negotiate and be, to Is the tension with Israel. Why? Because the US n e e d to withdraw. So Israel should be safe without the United States. So during the Trump administration, that kind of move is very clear. The, it looks like the US withdraws from Syria too early. But why? Because they, are, because they need to move rapidly. China is developing very fast. So they try to withdraw from Afghanistan now. And, uh, but uh, Biden administration swung in, and、uh, they, their tr- strategy is quite traditional American style. They still think the Middle East is very important. And,、uh, they, and they love the human rights issue, and in this case, they cannot,、uh, they cannot、uh, concede the human rights issue in Saudi Arabia. So, the situation is very complicated. They impose s- s a n c t i o n against Saudi Arabia, not against Iran. So, and they try to mediate the conflict, civil war in the Yemen. So, currently, Biden administration policy is not so clearly i n d i c a t e s the US strategic move from, the, from Europe and Middle East to the Indo Pacific. In my opinion, the current Biden administration needs a time to adjust the situation. Their traditional strategic viewpoint is it looks like a little old. And they are under the learning process. They are negotiating inside how to deal with China now. And in the near future, they will find clear. Situation. So it looks like the, what they want to do is different with what they need to do. So in the future, they will realize what they need to do 
But uh, after they got the power, first time they feel it, we want to do what they want to do. <laughs> so the so it, situation is like that. That is the reason a little complicated situation the role of Middle East has now. So maybe Saudi uh, or American side, the Saudi uh, Arab country need to take charge how to deal with Iran. It's one kind of ideal situation of the United States. And, uh, but uh, not clear so much in the last three months. Now that is my answer for the first question. Second uh, answer of the second question is uh, ASEAN's role. ASEAN country depend on China so much. So in this case, this country need two things at least. If the, this country stand with the United States, what kind of support U.S. will give them? That is very important. For example, the Vietnam resists China's move in South China Sea relatively strong. But after that, what kind of support U.S. will show? When we check the history, when the U.S. support of the British, after Japan attacked the Pearl Harbor, U.S. start to realize they need to support the United Kingdom. Before that, U.S. did not support the United Kingdom, uh, obviously, even if London is under bombing of the Nazis. Why? Because even if the U.S. president understands that they should support the British, that time the Roosevelt, they, this president need to persuade Voters in the United States, you, most of the U.S. citizens do not support the U.S. move to support the United Kingdom, uh, British in, during the World War II before Japan attacked Pearl Harbor. So in the democratic system, rapid move is a little difficult in some cases. Under such kind of situation, ASEAN countries are worrying if this country decide to resist China very strongly, can they receive the strong support from the United States? What kind of supports they can receive? They cannot imagine so much. So through the training, uh, through the joint exercises, US side should show what kind of support they can give them. That is the first step, I believe. And uh, Economically, ASEAN depends on China. That is another problem. United States, if the United States requests ASEAN country to support U.S. move toward China, U.S. need to create alternative market or alternative infrastructure investment to the ASEAN. Indo-Pacific strategy well, the, now, the, not to say strategy, but vision, originally came from the Japan's idea to give the, these countries alternative infrastructure investment. What the Obama administration is TPP. Indeed, the TP, when the Obama administration introduced the TPP, President Obama said, we will create the rule, not the China create the rule. So this is alternative market instead of China's market. This is the effort. Unfortunately, Trump administration dislikes uh, PPP, at least the beginning of their governance. So, so now the TPP do not include the United States. But, uh, but uh, indeed, uh, this is the right way to persuade ASEAN. And if ASEAN join, this is the center of the Indo-Pacific and the uh, key to deal with China. Uh, Japan believe, I believe. But that is answer. That is the role of ASEAN. Um, and uh, about the networks, about the network type security system. How to cooperate? 
Indeed, it's a formal alliance system. India discuss lot, Japan discuss a lot, formal alliance system. That kind of system is very outdated indeed. Because a formal alliance has formed beginning of the Cold War, but after that, we cannot find such kind of the treaty based alliance system. What happened in the Gulf War in 1990s and 20s, uh, 2000s? Currently, we say coalition of willing. What is coalition of willing? Coalition of willing is more flexible, not based uh, treaty or something fixed one. But still, case by case basis, it has worked. If so, even if network-based security system is a little rough, not fixed like treaty, but this is flexible, like coalition of willing. So how to work the network type security system? Maybe this is a hint. Maybe coalition of willing type system. And in each case, member is different, but still it will work as a counter-China strategy. That is my opinion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Nagao, for so patiently answering all the three questions uh, of uh, Muzaffar Hussain. Uh, I'm sure he's encouraged to now come to our webinars regularly and uh, see that we provide opportunities to participants to have a one-to-one -one interaction. Uh, I also have had requests uh, uh, for a long time from uh, Gursangeet Barar and uh, Bichat Date. I think their internet is not working fine today, so I wasn't seeing them. I don't see them on screen. Uh, so I will go and uh, request Professor Marwa had a question for you, Dr. Nagao. So <laughs> we'll ask Professor Marwa to step in at this stage. Uh, I hope their internet will work uh, fine soon and we'll have the two other people also making intervention. Professor Marwa, you could step in now. Um, thank you so much, uh, Professor Nagao. Really uh, delightful to hear all the layers and dynamics and contours of this relationship. And so many elements and aspects have been discussed by you. Uh, it's really, really wonderful. So my uh, two short questions. One, again, you know, we are seeing how each country has their own uh, coupling impact with China and how they are so closely intertwined. India cannot do without the investment. Australia, wine growers, you know, wine uh, uh, companies are suffering so much. Only $3 million of wine exported uh, despite alternate markets in 2020 for Australian. So their wine, their beef, their coal exports are suffering. Uh, we can also see that the United States, uh, Biden's policy as yet is not very clear and lucid. We also see regarding Prime Minister Suga, there are also rumblings whether, you know, he would also like to continue to engage China. You did show the graphs, but the graphs also say the story that it's a very, very slow process of decoupling and disengagement. So it, it's very evident, you know, that even though we are trying to decouple and we want to engage more, there are so many limitations. United States, $2 trillion uh, budget to be passed by the Senate, you know. So with the pandemic ravaged economies, uh, you know, how much can these countries, all of us, uh, you know, sort of stay away from that China factor and... Uh, uh, you know, secondly, um, the Quad itself, from 2007 to 2017, it was a lost decade. And uh, and now we are again, you know, reviving the Quad and talking about Quad Plus. But as you yourself said, that it's a very informal alliance, so to say, and there are breaks uh, on Quad. Uh, the United States has also started with the Blue Dot Network, but that is again about what maximum 50 to 60 million dollars that is proposed in comparison to a trillion dollars where China has already placed infrastructure on the ground. They have their workers in these countries. They have their 
uh, security people in these countries to look after all that infrastructure so therefore china has already entered and you know embedded itself in all these countries uh, in such a, a strong manner that it's very difficult to completely root it out so what do you think uh, is really the future of quad given all these limitations of each of these countries uh, you know to be sort of unable to disengage uh, from quad from uh, china thank you thank you very much the, there are two questions and uh, both are very good question firstly the coupling process of the quad country is very slow. That's uh, true. But uh, we should remember this is not war. This is competition. So this is a competition in the peacetime. But uh, this is uh, uh, not an uh, easy one. So looks like the Cold War between US and Soviet Union. This is a, looks like the military build up battle. Uh, but uh, this is not war. This is Cold War. So U.S.-China comp uh, competition is also, this is a competition in the peacetime. So process should be, the, should be slow. Or sh and the damage should be uh, minimum. So that is the reason the decoupling process is very slow. Indeed, this is only choice we can do in the peace time. Because uh, in the past, Japanese policymakers or the Japanese businessmen believe the bright future will come if the China develops well as an Asian friend. That has happened 20 or 30 years ago. That is the reason, even if the there are the, was a human rights uh, prob issue, problem in China. Japan continued to support China's development. But uh, view from now, uh, who is the most stupid man? Japanese. But uh, that time, Japanese believes the development of the Asian economy will create a bright future of the Indo-Pacific or Asia. So now we need to change the course. But uh, we have already invested huge in China and process should be practical. That is the reason the move is slow but steady. Japan is leaving, that's true. More than 23% Japanese has already lived last uh, seven years. No, 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 eight, eight years. So next eight years will come more. And uh, this is one kind of the Cold War, but not war. Indeed, uh, China's problem is a problem of money. So that is a proper way. When we check the threat level, threat type of the Russia and China, Russia is Bagra. Because if there is a military, uh, there is a chance to in military intervention, Russia has done. In the Crimea, Eastern Ukraine, Syria, and Libya, Russia good arch to use military power. The operation is beautiful. But at the same time, in the long run, their economy is too much depend on the exporting natural resources, and their economy is weak. Uh, their population is similar with Japan, indeed. So, Russia's threat type is burger. Instead of the Russia, China's threat type is thief. If they find the power vacuum, they try to steal it. That is China's pattern. So, and why China can do it? Because they find the power vacuum, because their military budget is ample. Increase the military budget and compare with other countries, their military power is bigger than them. And uh, that is the reason they can find the power back more easily. They can push it. But at the same time, if China lost the income, they cannot continue this policy. Because they are not the burglars, they are safe, steal something, 
if they find a vacuum. We should not create a vacuum by maintaining military balance. So, view from such kind of thread type. Competition in the peacetime is a proper way to deal with China. So, decoupling is a little slow, that's true, but at the same time, this is proper way. There is a possibility US push more, push Japan to do more indeed in the future. Uh, so, speed up is needed, but uh, still, this process is proper way, I believe. And so, I should answer the second question. Uh, size of the budget China use as investment to the many developing countries is far bigger than the quad based Indo Pacific strategy based or vision based infrastructure, infrastructure investment. That's true. But when we check the result of the investment, a little different result we can see, we can identify. Japan's project is work able project. Japan check many details, negotiate with many actors, and after that, Japan spends a little long time, but uh, cre create perfect planning. And uh, real port, real air port, work able infrastructure will come. That is uh, Indo Pacific. Uh, vision based infrastructure project. China's one is different. China suggests huge money, but they haven't checked details so much. Hambantota port is one of the examples. After they build the port, how to use it? International airport in Hambantota, who use it? They, yes. They build the infrastructure no one use. Is this workable? Is this a proper investment? And finally, China suggests Sri Lanka, they will control it. This is not a good infrastructure investment. So size of the money is not uh, everything. Workable is everything. That is my answer. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Nagao. I appreciate your patiently answering each of our questions. Uh, yeah. You can now ask your question. Well, thank you, sir. Uh, first of all, uh, Nagao, sir, very good evening. Uh, it was my pleasure to hear your webinar. It was really very informative. Uh, so let me introduce myself now. Uh, myself, Vikhyat. I am a student of Mumbai University and right now I'm pursuing my master's in the subject of political science. So, sir, as you uh, mentioned in your PPT that how India, Australia and Japan should cooperate with the US to counter China. So, my question here was uh, that can Japan support the Taiwan cause and even the Tibetan cause uh, to counter China? Uh, in the South China Sea, it is my question. And my second question is, uh, so as we know that China, uh, China's present, presence in Sri Lanka is growing day by day and, if, uh, and even India and Japan are trying to increase the influence in Sri Lanka, Sri Lanka. but to a some extent, they are not, uh, uh, the, means they are failing to spread the influence in uh, Sri Lanka as compared to China. So do you think that uh, um, the means uh, Quad Group, it is very important for Quad Group that India and ja India and Japan's influence will should improve in Sri Lanka. So do you think that the Belt and Road Initiative is uh, benefiting as compared to Quad Group as Sri Lanka is going in China's orbit? What is your response, sir? Thank you very much for asking. Yeah, this is uh, okay. There are many good questions today. <laughs> yeah, this is also a good question. Can Japan support Taiwan? Answer is yes. But at the same time, how? A little, a little quad way we have done indeed. For example, the, because uh, 
Taiwan is very sensitive issue for China. And in, at the same time, location of the Taiwan is the best place to attack China indeed. That is the reason that we, we cannot lose Taiwan. So Japan is the most nearest country for Taiwan. It is easy to connect. Without China enter the Japan's air, they cannot cut the supply line for Taiwan from the United States because the uh, nearest island located uh, from nearest, Japan is a very long country and the islands located just side of Taiwan, one of the islands located the side of Taiwan. So through the Japan's air, US can bring the supply to Taiwan. This is one of the supply routes. And without China enter the Japan's air, so it is not easy to cut completely, I believe. Uh, so Japan is a very vital location to support Taiwan. And uh, so Taiwan faced a crisis, that's true. Only 15 countries support Taiwan diplomatically. That is the reason that during the Trump administration, they start to impose a sanction against the country who, which changed the formal diplomatic relation uh, from Taiwan to China. So, and uh, for example, the, one of the examples is Palau. Why the US uh, Secretary of Defense went to the industry, Mike Esper, uh, yeah, yeah, visit uh, Palau, very small island country, near Philippines, because uh, Palau is one of the country to support Taiwan. And Palau is one of the strategic places uh, to support Philippines. So, Quad country support Palau now. Why? Because one, this is one of the supporting policy toward Taiwan and uh, in the, uh, of course, Philippines too. So, in case of Taiwan, the US, Japan, Australia, well, Australia is a little different, but the US and Japan will not abandon Taiwan anyway. In case of Tibet, yes, US is moving. They have already contact with the leadership in the Tibet. And, but at the same time, in case of Tibet, India's role is very important. So, I believe you, India and the United States has already uh, planning jointly to support Tibet. But uh, I'm not sure, I do not know the details because uh, this is, uh, in 1950s, uh, intelligence, uh, intelligence organization of the, these two countries co collaborate to support rebellion in Tibet. So, Indeed, this is a traditional cooperation between India and the US. Japan's involvement is very limited in this region, I believe. But uh, India and the US has already started to cooperate. The South China Sea, Japan's role is very important. And uh, instead of the US, sometimes Japan's was a patrol in South China Sea, indeed, along with Australia. And now the French nuclear submarine or UK aircraft carrier will come in South China Sea. So, this is Quad Plus Corporation in South China Sea. Germany also come. They will have already negotiated with Australia to use the port to deploy warship. Germany, UK's aircraft carrier and the French nuclear submarine. They need these ship in the Europe, I believe, but they deploy this ship in South China Sea, completely open side of us for them. So now the Quad Plus is moving and uh, military, uh, equipment are coming as a reinforcement. So Japan also joined. It will really happen. About Sri Lanka, how could Quad how could improve the situation? Under current government of Sri Lanka, it is not easy. We depend on India's influence in Sri Lanka indeed. But uh, when we check the politics in Sri Lanka, they change the government in through the election. At least st still, 
we believe election will change the government. So in the future, the next government will come and that will be the chance to improve the situation, I believe. Under current government, they have already cooperated with China too deeply. It is not easy to separate, I believe. But uh, too much, too deep cooperation create too corrupted situation in most cases. Especially the relation with China is corrupted in many countries. So in the near future, people will realize many corruption in Sri Lanka and they will tire to see the current government. It has happened. The last election, uh, last election is uh, maybe when citizen won the election. That time, the uh, people did not like the corrupted government led by Rajapaksa, same Rajapaksa. So, if the current government continue this course, history will repeat it, I believe. But not, but now, is not the time to improve the situation and we rely on the India's influence to the Sri Lanka because uh, India's influence is far bigger than the other three's influence. US, Japan, Australia do not have such kind of a big influence in Sri Lanka, but India has. That is my answer. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nagao. Uh, I hope your prognosis uh, comes Thank through. you, sir. And uh, it seems uh, uh, that fundamentally, leaders in Sri Lanka, just like in most countries, are driven by their own uh, national interests, uh, sometimes regime interests, uh, sometimes that is individuals' interests. And uh, Rajapaksas are in good command of the politics right now in uh, Sri Lanka, as you know so well. But Taiwan is an interesting case that you mentioned, uh, only 15 countries left now. Uh, the future of uh, uh, our world is increasingly becoming dependent on semiconductors. And uh, perhaps many of you understand and know this, about 60 plus percent, up to 65 in some cases percent of the manufacturing of semiconductors uh, happens in Taiwan. Another 25 percent in South Korea. So imagine these two countries together controlling bulk of uh, manufacturing of semiconductors. Of course, uh, the chip designing <laughs> is in control of United States. That is where uh, chip designing happens. And just like Apple phones are uh, conceived, improvised, created in the United States, or manufactured in mainland China. Now, so each country has also its own uh, strong points in that sense, whether it is rare earth materials, for example. So uh, sometimes some of us think 15 countries left uh, recognizing Taiwan would make Taiwan very vulnerable, but that's not true actually. It's a very small country, but extremely powerful in terms of uh, electronics, but increasingly for a decade now in semiconductors, which is what is required in whatever uh, gadgets that we use, whether it is automobiles, uh, to aeroplanes, to your watches in your hand, everything almost, refrigerators, all, all you know, consumer products. And uh, let me now uh, request Gaurav Datta is with us, and he's also requested for uh, time to make an intervention. So please introduce yourself and then make your intervention. Uh, hello, can you hear me? Yes, indeed. Yeah. Uh, Nagao Sensei. Konnichiwa. Konnichiwa. <laughs> oh, nice to meet you. I'm myself a PhD student here in JNU at the Center for Indo-Pacific Studies. So my uh, short question to you is, um, what do you think uh, uh, about limitations to India-Japan strategic cooperation? Uh, because of our of India's historically uh, close ties with Russia, because this is some question that I had come across a lot of Japanese scholars while I was in Japan. So this is something that uh, I, I had always pondered upon. So do you feel there are any limitations uh, in terms of India-Japan strategic cooperation because of our close ties with Russia? If you could please elaborate. Thank you. Okay, it's a final. Yeah, yeah this is a good question. But at the same time, the final uh, question should not be the uh, 
be mitted <laughs> of the relation is. But at the same time, they, yes, you are right. For example, the, when Japan tried to export the submarine to India, and which is India's request, there are, there are plenty of the opposition inside of Japan because uh, Japan do not show our submarine to Russian, they said. Because uh, India has uh, many Russian equipment, uh, military equipment. To main maintenance, maintain the, these equipment. Sometimes Russian uh, uh, Russian uh, tech engineer or the military officer come to the India and check it. Uh, such kind of the high level of the maintenance is needed uh, in some case. In this case, if Japan's submarine located inside of the India's Navy's port, Russian can see the Japan submarine. That is a concern. So Japan cannot share the latest technology with Russian. It's a limit. Japan, India relation. That's true. But uh, at the same time, uh, because of the Russian policy, situation is changing, I believe, because uh, increasing the India's uh, imports, American equipment, or well, France equipment, uh, instead of Russia, Israel equipment also. So, situation is changing now, I believe. Limitation in Japan side is also a very big problem. Indeed, uh, for a long time, Japan's policy is hide behind the United States. Why? Japan is a country we haven't lost the war and occupied by foreign countries last 2000 years, except the United States. So for Japan, relation with the United States is the most important priority. Cordial relation with the United States guarantee Japan to live 2,000 years more. That is the reason we were, our policy based on we will not fight with the United States again. That, that is the reason nearly 70 years ago, Japanese policymaker create many systems to prevent war with the United States. But that is the reason Japan limit, limit our capability to attack the United States. Even if the US, even if the small strike capability, if the United States think Japan try to leave from US side, it will be nightmare the Japanese leaders believe that time. So as a result, Japan do not have the will to show the military strength. That's uh, at least by the end of Cold War. At that time, USA, cap of bottle theory. Japan is only exceptional champagne. And if there is a US-Japan alliance as a cap, the Japanese do not feel security is important. So Asia will be safe. America explains China, America explains South Korea. This theory, that is the reason US-Japan alliance is very important. US protect Japan instead of Japanese, and that is the reason Japan will not become the champagne spread in Asia. But after the Cold War, US start to say, Japan should show uh, Japan should share the security burden with the United States if Japan say they are equal ally of the United States or equal friend of the United States. Suddenly, Japan is surprised. This is completely different course. So, first in the Gulf War, Japan tried to use money. Money is not harm. Money will not harm anything. Instead of the missile, instead of the military equipment, Japan, Japan gives the uh, United States money to fight in the Gulf War. But uh, Kuwait or other country or the part of the US people say, this is a quad way. 
Japan should fight in the front line with the United States. So in the, in the Iraq war, Japan sent Japan sent the troops to stay in Iraq to rebuild the Iraq and start to show their influence. But still, Japan hesitated to use military power. Japan hesitated to show the military power, even if Japan faced China's threat now. So when India think if Japan if India cooperate with Japan, Japan will send the reinforcement. For example, Japan will show the military uh, military strength to to attack China, and that is the reason China withdraw the troops from the India-China border to the redeploy the eastern side against Japan. If the India expects such kind of the Japan's uh, support as the EQRI of in India, indeed, uh, Japan's mindset to deal with the security situation hasn't developed so well or ha hasn't been so courageous. Because the traditional way of Japanese is try to hide our military intention and do not separate the other country by military equipment. So that is a reason, that is a limit what Japan can do. But uh, in this case, finally, I need to say Japan is changing. Why Japan start to talk about strike capability, even if it's limited. Japan start to realize the benefit of the strike capability. Japan start to realize what we need to do. So Japan is changing, and this change is a hope for India-Japan relation. Japan will export arms. In the future, more latest weapon Japan will export without few hesitation. Not now, but changing. And the changing speed is slow, but uh, once the line Japan cross, speed will be up, I believe. Well, there are many other limitations. The building crop process is uh, uh, very complicated in both countries. Or as uh, this kind of cooperation itself is quite new, uh, new itself is a uh, uh, new situation, demand, huge effort, <laughs> always. So many things, many limitations exist, but at the same time, this Japan's attitude or the India's relation with Russia, this is, uh, these are very important, that's true. Maybe I should not uh, answer uh, too long, but thank you very much thank asking. You. This is a good question. Thank you, Dr. Nagao. Um, I understand why you are also sometimes called Officer Nagao. You have still a lot of energy and we have already crossed 45 minutes beyond the time that we had uh, anticipated for this lecture. So let me ask you the very last question of today's session. It's a very dear friend of our association who is not able to unmute himself. Uh, He's a retired senior civil servant uh, from Government of India. His name is Murli Dharan Nayar. And his question is that uh, in, in case quadrilateral security dialogue uh, begins to gather momentum and, uh, you know, you are talking of quad plus and you're even saying quad could become Asian NATO, how likely, he says, is China to respond by putting up a counter mechanism which might involve China, Pakistan, Turkey, Iran, Malaysia, do you see China evolving some similar counter mechanism to Asian NATO that you look forward to coming and becoming a reality? There is no reality, I believe, because China is alone, because of China's uh, attitude toward others. So China cannot form the quad right cooperation. Quad right cooperation based on the traditional American lead security alliance. India is newcomer, but as a Quad member, Australia, Japan, or Quad Plus member, US allies in the Europe, or as some country in the Southeast Asia, they have already cooperated with the United States for a long time. So because of this, Quad is practical, and we can see the Quad as a cooperation. In case of China, former ally is only the North Korea. 
Pakistan is very friendly, received the support from China, that's true. But uh, they are not formal ally. This uh, ally, ally or a friendly country with China is quite limited and not well organized. Not like the US leads uh, security system. So if China tried to create uh, a similar kind of the US lead security system, it is nearly impossible because they, are, they need more effort. They need to change the attitude. And uh, indeed, indeed, compared with the United States, China lacks the dream. US, US, uh, US, why US system has worked as a superpower? Because they can correct a very elite in the world as an immigration system. They collect the power from other country. Of course, uh, they, can, they can develop their own power inside of the United States, but at the same time, this is a destination of the elite. If someone is intellectual and they want to get a huge research budget, this uh, research or expert go to the United States. Many Indians working in the United States, why? Because uh, this is a place to develop something. China hasn't developed such kind of system. Even if China invests some for the experts in other country, because China's developing system is indeed based on one ethnic, Han ethnic. This is not multi-ethnic country. Even if they claim this is multi-ethnic. So China's system is system only for Chinese or only for Han ethnic. In this case, many other countries do not wish to join. We do not wish to join. But the American system is acceptable for other countries because they can join, they can contribute, and they get back the sum to their country, go and return. Working uh, Indian working in the United States can return to India to develop. This is exchanges. This system is more strong compared with China. So US can, US system can give the other countries a dream. Yeah, I'm the relative pro US. That's true, but uh, yeah, US experience is US good. But at the same time, it has really happened. I believe many research or many elite in the other country. Do you wish to go to China to study and contribute to China? Maybe most of them say they do not wish to. But American cases, they, many people wish to. This is a completely different. That is the reason American can lead currently, even if the, yeah, at least relatively better as a reader, I believe. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Dr. Nagao. As Henry Kissinger says, every major nationality around the planet is represented in the United States. So United States in that sense is a very unique uh, kind of an example, which uh, no other nation uh, has as yet been able to develop. Because relatively, uh, the ethnicity cohesion or predominance of one community is much more uh, the reality in most other nations. Uh, we have spent really a long time beyond the stipulated time. So that shows that uh, both the fact that you were very patient with each of the questions and our participants had a good takeaway from you, but also the fact that we received so many questions uh, to your presentation, which is a very good sign uh, of your uh, very well-structured uh, conversation on a very, very relevant topic. Uh, let me stop here and now request Professor Marwa to formally propose word of thanks and also announce uh, in the next uh, webinar of AAS. Professor Marwa. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Singh. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor Nagao. It's really been a delight and pleasure to hear from you, not only about all the historical events, which actually formed the bedrock of your uh, presentation and uh, you know provided it that vitality 
and i don't know what time you ate supper but you're still like as if it's you know early morning for you when you're going into late night but you're i think you know that energy which you exude uh, and the knowledge uh, which comes with it is absolutely astounding and uh, as uh, professor singh said that you know we've been here uh, one hour beyond our time and that's really quite a rare uh, situation but you have brought in so many different perspectives you've also uh, gazed into the future you know that crystal ball ga- gazing uh, what's going to happen to quad and what's going to happen to china and which way do countries want to band uh, with and uh, you know the centrality of japan one can really see uh, how japan is so committed Uh, to take this particular quad grouping and uh, you know how you are so keen to take forward the rules based order which china as you you know the first bullet point in your presentation was that china does not want to follow any law it wants to set its own rules and um, so thank you so much i have really no words as you can see the uh, people who stayed and you know continued to engage um, so we have had many firsts with your lecture and i'm sure there'll be an opportunity to engage you again uh, sometime in the future but thank you so much and we love to stay connected with you on facebook and social media as professor singh said in understanding where you are which part of the planet uh, you know so uh, thank you so much and to uh, a big thank you to all our participants for today everyone who joined us and asked questions very stimulating questions and excellent uh, responses so our next uh, webinar the 39th session will be on 17th of march so first and third uh, wednesday of march uh, and uh, our speaker is dr robert t tally junior is a distinguished professor in humanities and an honorary professor of international studies from the department of english from texas state university and he would be speaking to us on globalization world literature and social distancing reading in the time of a pandemic so i'm sure it's going to be a uh, very interesting uh, different uh, a uh, takeaway and different uh, you know nuanced uh, understanding of how the pandemic has shaped people's lives and society all around us but we are really looking forward to all of you uh, joining us uh, two wednesdays from now until then stay safe stay well and god bless you all and thank you so much uh, professor nagao very nice thank you very much thank you dr nagao for being with us and thank you particularly to participants who stayed on with us till such late uh, in in the lecture all of you are busy i understand but thank you for staying on with us we'll have uh, now lectures on first and third wednesdays so please uh, share it with friends we have now shifted to first and third wednesdays of the month and of course uh, we look forward to you suggesting uh, topics i I had opportunities where the participants have also suggested topics and speakers otherwise we continue to bring you the speakers from around the world like we just now had uh, dr nagao from tokyo it's uh, almost 11 o'clock for you i suppose or more 11:30 i suppose that's it so it's nearing midnight for him so thank you for staying on with us and thank you each one of you we look forward to continuing this as i mentioned we also encourage young people who are contributing commentaries so think of some subjects if you wish to write commentaries for us and just spread it around with your friends uh, these are webinars that you can join and we always emphasize on each of you engaging also at bilateral level with the speaker so that format has continued thank you everyone and uh, God bless you all, and we will meet now, as uh, Professor Marwa mentioned, on 17th of March for the next lecture. And I think an equally interesting lecture on globalization, world literature, and uh, social distancing. What is happening to uh, literature, world literature during times of pandemic? 
when uh, reading habits have been impacted both positively and negatively people are reading much more because they are confined but the choices of reading are very different because you're not literally visiting uh, shops to look at uh, the books as you usually did before the pandemic you're confined to online reading increasingly so it's an interesting conversation with a very very well known professor on world literatures from state university of texas uh, I have also requested uh, Professor Marwa to chair that session. She is more closely connected to literature than I am, so I'm sure she will make a great chair on that. So thank you, everyone. Uh, best wishes. Stay safe. Thank you and good night. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am.